Hey crossover, it's me, Siri again. Listen, I really like that raw servant guy. Like the teenagers say, he is lit. Ha ha ha. Now, we are back for part 4 of our summer series you asked for it. Today we are touching some controversial subjects and even some adult content. Today is PG-13 at church if you know what I mean. LOL. I'm even going to put Pastor T in the hot seat myself. So let's make some noise as we get started. All right. Crossover, are you ready for part four of You Asked For It? Are you ready? So we've been doing this series that is different than what we normally do. You guys are actually helping us shape the series with the questions that you ask. And so this is not the way we normally do it, but uh, we're having some fun and answering some serious questions again today. Uh, some of the content is going to be for adults. So if you have kids in here, please run and check them in the kids' church. We warned you, okay? So here, here's a couple of rules for this series, all right? So first of all, if a question is asked and the Bible directly answers it, then we're going to look directly at the Scripture. You may not like the answer all the time, but we're going to answer what the Scripture says. We believe in God's Word. We stand on it here at Crossover. Y'all with me? Yeah. So if it's not directly answered in the Bible, then we're going to look at biblical principles. If we can't exactly find a biblical principle, we may give you our opinion, but we're going to help you uh, and let you know kind of the scenarios uh, in between each one of those different situations. So here's an important word for today, guys. Somebody say context. Context. When we read the Bible and look at it, context is key. It's super important. When I went to Bible college, uh, that's something that I learned. And it's funny because this week I got to go back to my college, Southeastern University, uh, where me and Lucy met. Uh, and I did a concert with my man DJ Lopez. He's back there. We had the FCA camp. It was, it was incredible. So back at Southeastern, I learned that when you read a passage of Scripture, you have to also look at the context, meaning who it was being written to originally and what the culture was like at that time because that's very important and that can bring out the meaning of the scripture in a powerful way, makes it a lot more vivid, makes it come to life. So somebody say context is key. So even this is what last week, let me give you an example. I was at a, at a house of some of our crossover family and several people were there and some people that have been at the church for a while, they mentioned this situation that happened a few years ago and we all started laughing and the other people were like, they felt left out. So we had to give them context and share a little bit about the situation. And then when they understood then the stories and whatnot, then they started laughing too, right? Because they knew the context, right? So in scripture, you know, when we understand that context, then we might laugh too. There's some funny things in scripture, but there's some serious things. And then we have to look at it and say, okay, God, prayerfully and carefully, how do I apply this to my life today? How does this relate to me? How is it relevant to me? in 2018, and we do that carefully and prayerfully. So today, a lot of the questions we're going to talk about um, have to deal really with context. So again, say context is key. All right, let's talk to God really quick one more time. God, we love you today. We just pray that right now over these next couple minutes, you're going to help us to focus in, help us to be open as we look at these questions and we look at answers from your word and from biblical principles. God, and God, we pray that we'll listen with open ears. We won't say, oh, this is for my friend, but we'll say, this is for me. There's some things I can pull out of this, God. So speak to us today, God. Use me today. Use everything that's going to take place, God. And we're going to be sure to give you the honor and the credit. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Amen. Amen. All right, so crossover, you ready for the first question? Come on, man. It sounds like there's six people here. Y'all ready for the first question? Yeah. There we go. There we go. There's, there's my people right there. This is the first question I'm going to tackle today. It reads like this. It says, society has given women a feminist attitude. That's what somebody wrote. That they can do anything dependent from a man. The Bible teaches that the husband should respect the wife. The wife should be submissive. So with the world teaching women that they should be independent, and I have a wife that's a dominant type of personality. She doesn't like the idea of a husband having authority over her. Um, how can a husband like me lead his wife as God wants him to. Signed, no, I'm just kidding. We would have been in trouble. <laughs> uh, look at the person next to you and say, uh-oh, it's about to get real. 
So listen, first off, contextually, let me talk about culture and who was being written to the Bible when it mentioned some of these different things. Um, culture is definitely different today than it was back then when the scripture was being written in many different ways, right? In many ways, it's, it's gotten better and improved in some ways. Because unfortunately, um, back in the day in many countries, women were looked at as second-class citizens and sometimes even property, right? And so, I mean, there's even still countries in the world today where women are treated like that. And this was written in the Middle East. And just in the Middle East, just like what, a month or two ago, women in Saudi Arabia were finally given the legal right to be able to drive. And as I was going through Facebook one day, I saw this viral video. Maybe you saw it. It's this lady. I don't know what she's saying, but she was rapping. And she was driving. She had her head wrap on, man. She, I don't know what she was saying, but, man, she looked, she looked happy. Good for her, right? <laughs> she's able to drive now, right? So, but anyways, so there's been a lot of improvement with equality between men and women and th them getting paid the same amount and being respected and women can vote and they can drive cars now, right? And that's a good thing because Galatians, it actually says that in, in Christ, there's no more slave or free or Jew or Gentile or male or female. We're all equal in Christ. So that's, that's, what, that's what God's plan. That's what Jesus wants. We're all supposed to be equal, right? But at the same time, there's still an order that God has in place between men and women and leadership and, and roles. Ephesians 5 breaks down those roles. So Ephesians 5 says to women, it says that uh, they are supposed to submit to their husbands. But then it says the husbands that they are supposed to love their wives as Christ loves the church. And who's the church? It's us. We are. And we got issues. And Christ still loves us. So... A wife has issues, so does the husband, but, but the husband's supposed to really love the wife even through her issues, okay? But, but here, everybody say context. So when you look at that passage in, in Ephesians 5, it starts in verse 22, but we got to go back to the verse before that, right? And the verse before that, at the beginning of that thought, that conversation, Paul says, submit to one another, before it says submit husbands or wives, submit to your husbands, so a lot of husbands are like, see woman? See what it says? you got to submit. But wait, wait, the verse before that says submit to one another. So that means that husbands sometimes have to submit to their wives in different ways and have to compromise and sacrifice and do different things. It becomes this mutual thing as well. So it's not just like, you know, wives have to do everything husbands say. That's, that's not what the scripture means in, in context, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't mean that at all. Here, here's a big important thing. The difference in roles doesn't make men and women unequal. There's just different functions. So it doesn't mean you're not equal. There's, there's just different functions. God doesn't consider wives inferior or inadequate or less important or less responsible than husbands. Besides, any wise husband is going to want to listen to his wife and get her opinion and her advice and, and her discernment. Um, any wise husband is going to know that his wife can be the greatest asset that he has on earth, right? Behind every great man is a great what? That's, that's a saying that a lot of people say, right? First service was much more excited about that. The women were much more, ex I don't know. And there was like, there, you got way more people here. I don't know, the women aren't excited. Anyways, so, but, but listen, um, I would not be where I'm at today if it wasn't for my wife. If it wasn't for her words and her support and her prayer and her pouring into me, and her giving me advice that I listened to. I had to learn to listen to that sometimes. Earlier in the marriage, I was like, oh, you know, nah, I got this, you know. And then I was like, oh, she was right on that. <laughs> you know, I had to humble myself. And so, so here's the thing, y'all. Um, Christians have varying opinions about the practical mechanics of, well, how does that work with spiritual leadership in the home? So it might look different in some things, but so how does it look in Pastor Tommy's home? Because I have... A strong, intelligent, Puerto Rican wife that has a master's degree, and she's smart. She's sitting in the front row now. I, you know, I thought you weren't going to be in this service, babe. She was in the first service. She's like, I'm going to be in her service. <laughs> um, and she's wise, and she's articulate, and she's smart. And so, so how does all that work? A lot of guys were really, like, intimidated. I was a little intimidated at first when I first met her. I was like, 
these guys were like, man, you can't, you can't pull her at Southeastern Lopez. They were like, you know, oh, man, we, we try, girl, guys, I've tried to talk to Lucy, man. She shuts them down. I was like, Ooh, all right, come on, got this, man. Lopez was praying for me, man. <laughs> so, but anyways, uh, how does it work for us? How does it work in, in our home? Here's the thing, y'all. Generally, if a husband and wife have a good, solid relationship, and we've been married now for 22 and a half years, woo, got to throw the half in there. But we haven't been just married, and we stay together for the kids, and we're just toughing it out, and we don't want to look bad in front of the church. No, I can authentically, genuinely say we have a good relationship. We have a healthy marriage. When you have a healthy marriage, you know what? You learn to make decisions together. There are some things I lean on her that she has more discernment in or more knowledge in, there's some things that she'll lean on me in some areas I'm stronger in. So we complement each other, right? So we do a lot of those things as equals, and we look to Christ ultimately as the head of our home. Now we compare our skills and our knowledge, and, and, and we take task on based on our individual strengths. For instance, like, you know, she can cook. Me, I'm just the spaghetti guy. That's about it. And I can heat it up in the microwave, and sometimes that doesn't even always work out. You know, the kids are like, this is still cold, you know. <laughs> Anyways, uh, but, you know, I'll cut the grass or whatever, you know. But those are some little things, but there's even many tasks that we share together. But there's things that she's better at than me, and, and she'll lead in those areas, and there's things I'm better at, and I'll lead. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, we also recognize in the final analysis that the husband biblically is supposed to carry a little bit more of the weight spiritually to lead. But she trusts me to do that because I've been doing all the things I should do as a husband, and I've been leading her and my daughter. So it, it's not this fight of trying to like, no, I'm the leader. I'm the, you know, we both share a lot of things. But at the end of the day, there's also this spiritual leadership that I know that, that falls on me as responsibility. And so here's another question that came up. And, and, and on that note, there was a husband that said this. My wife wanted to know. He's anonymous. <laughs> if the culture is different from the times of the Bible, and now both men and women work outside of the home, how is the wife being submissive to the husband? How is that still relevant? It's a good question. Here's how I want to answer that to start out with. So pay attention to this first line here. How much money you make does not qualify who the leader is. Let me say that again. How much money you make does not qualify who the leader is. Spiritually, at the end of the day, you know, again, there's some things that each one of us may lead in because we're stronger, but at the end of the day, many times money can be used as a weapon or a tool with both men and women. So if you're the one that makes the most, then you can kind of want to be controlling of it. For men and for women, well, I, may, I bring in all the money here, so you got to listen to what I say. You only bring it in a little bit. Well, I pay all these bills. You only pay that. Listen, remember what I said a few months ago? We're supposed to have joint accounts together. Remember that? Anyways, you can go back and watch that on the rewind. That's why a lot of people get in trouble. Those are her bills. Oh, you know, she owes me money. Like, what are you talking about? You're married. It's all supposed to be in one pot. But anyways, earlier... Earlier in our marriage, um, I was just working as a youth pastor when Crossover had like 40 people at it, and they weren't even able to pay me regularly. And when they did, it was only a couple hundred dollars a week, and that was like once a month sometimes or every other week. And, you know, I was rapping and doing concerts a little bit, trying to make a little extra money. But my wife got her master's degree, and she landed a good job. She was a director at a nonprofit, and she was the breadwinner. She was crushing it. She was doing great. But there wasn't tension in our relationship at that point, like, oh, man, my wife makes more than me. Oh, man. And she wasn't like, look, you better step it up, Urban D. You know, it wasn't. <laughs> she loved me. She believed in me. She knew me before I made it. <laughs> and then when I signed a record deal <laughs> in 1999 and I started traveling and touring and, and bringing in a lot more income, like, we, it, I wasn't suddenly like, now I got you. <laughs> what? You know? <laughs> God always provided, the bottom line was this. But the point is, there were some years that she made more money than me. And we were okay with that. It doesn't need to be a competition. It should never be. You're on the same team. Y'all feel me? If you're married, you're on the same team. So this thing of trying to, like, fight each other, to like, who's control and who's got the top notch and who's, 
Like, no, and my wife has learned to trust me as a spiritual leader. Um, so if we're looking, if we, so how do you become a spiritual leader? If you're looking at Jesus as our model, that can only mean one thing, y'all. You have to become a servant leader. Jesus said this in, in Matthew chapter 20, very countercultural, verse 25. He said this. He was talking to his disciples. He said, you know that the rulers in this world, they lord it over their people. And officials flaunt their authority over those that are under them. We can see that many times, right? In certain governments, maybe at your job, it's like that sometimes. I mean, we could come up with all kinds of, you know, examples of that, right? But look what Jesus says. This is a red letter. He says, but among you, it will be what? Somebody say different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. But that's not what culture teaches us. Because when you become a leader, many times, then you get more servants that serve you. You get more perks. You get all this stuff. You get a secretary. You get all these, you know, all these things. You get assistance. You get, but Jesus is here saying, no, when you become a leader, then you step up and you serve even more. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's kind of countercultural. Jesus goes on. He says, whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. So, like, the first becomes last almost, right? But the last will be first, right? In heaven. So it says, for Jesus is now talking about himself in third person. He says, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to what? And to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus like laid it all on the line for us, right? He gave his life. So a spiritual servant leader then imitates Christ. Imitates Christ. They're tuned in. So as a, if you're the, the husband, the man, the leader of the house, you got to be tuned in to your family's needs, to your kids' needs, to try to help them grow spiritually, to be praying over them, to be having conversations with them, to be reading the scripture with them sometimes and breaking some stuff out. You're, you're ready to protect, to help, to defend in season and out of season, right? There's a lot of men that are not doing that. There's a lot of men that get, you know, in this funk or they've never seen that led before and so then women got to step into that role. And then the men kind of just get passive and, and then there's just all these all this blurriness that happens and this confusion that can happen in a home. But, but husbands, fathers, like we're called to lay our life on the line. Like we're all servants said, lay our life on the line. You know, every time, like I, I'm ready to lay my life on the line for my girls, for my wife and for my daughters. Like whatever they need, whatever I need to do, like that's what I need to be about. That, that's, that's my calling. That's my duty. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. So, so how can men step up to be strong leaders? I mean, I gave you a little example here, but I realize because there's a lot of men, we haven't seen examples of that. But you got to put some new tools on your tool belt. You got to learn from some other people. You got to read some stuff. You got to get around some people that have successful marriages. And there's some successful marriages here, some great dudes that are crushing it. Listen, we do a, a, a thing called Fight Club. How many of y'all been to Fight Club? Men, make some noise. Fight Club, Fight Club, yeah. <laughs> So we do it now. It's a quarterly breakfast. So next month in the month of August, stay, stay, stay tuned for the date. Pay attention for the date. We're going to be having another men's breakfast. And I'm actually going to be sharing. God kind of put it on my heart as I was, you know, going through this. Like next month, we're going to talk about and break that down. Like how do we become the leaders we need to be in our home? So guys, be there. Ladies, po poke the guy next to you. Be like, you going, you going to that. You going to that. So, all right, y'all with me? We'll keep it moving. Last Sunday, we talked about spiritual gifts. We addressed the crossover believes in spiritual gifts and how it should look, you know, in a public worship experience. You can go back and watch the replay, right? I finished with reading verse 33, where it talks about that, you know, there should be order and peace in all the public worship services, right? So that's how we ended. So I had, like, two ladies corner me in the lobby after services last week. They didn't corner me. I'm in the lobby. You can come up and talk to me, ask me questions. And so I shared with them. They said, well, listen, well, I, I was looking at that passage you read, but then I read the next verse, and it says this. And so we look at the next verse, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34, and then 35, it says this. It says, women should be silent during the church meetings. Shh. <laughs> women, stop laughing. Start next week. We're shutting it down. We're going to be a biblical church. It goes on and says, it is, what are you laughing at? This is what the Bible says. It is not proper for them to speak. They should be submissive just as the law says. If they have questions, they should ask their husbands at home. For it is improper for women to speak in church meetings. 
Ooh, man, like, what's, what's going on? <laughs> wow. So first off, we have to go back to context, okay? We got to go back to context of what was happening to this audience that this was being written to. It was the church of Corinth, city of Corinthians, the book of Corinthians, right? And so that city, Paul had planted this church, so he had a right to speak to them like that. He was like the father, the spiritual father of the church. And so there he was, he was speaking to them. And in, in that city, it was very expressive. It was very much like, yo, look at me. It was a very like show out type of environment. Everybody wanted attention. So when people became Christ followers and they started going to the church, many of them dragged in some of that cultural baggage in the church. And we do that too in America materialism, consumerism, all that stuff that's in the culture, we bring that into church. We're like, oh, man, you know, I didn't like that song today. Oh, man, it was too hot in there. Like, like, wait a minute, you didn't go to church for you. You went for God. You're there to worship him. But we get in this consumer baggage, right? So they had this baggage from the culture, and, and now because they were very expressive and they wanted to be seen, they were using spiritual gifts in public worship experiences, and it was just chaos, so people were standing up and giving a prophecy, and then somebody else would cut them off and yell, and then this person was speaking in tongues, and 17 people were speaking in tongues at the same time, and it was just the services were just like chaos and crazy. So, so Paul here is saying, like, listen, this has got to get under control. I was in a church service like that one time. It was actually, we were talking about Southeastern. It was at college. I'll never forget it. I'm sitting in a church service, and somebody got up and gave a word for the Lord, and then somebody else got up after he was done and said, no, this is what the Lord says. And then somebody else cut that person off and said, uh-uh, this is what the Lord says, and was even louder. And then a teacher got up and was like, chapel is dismissed. Everybody leave now. Like, the main people were not at chapel that day. It was like some professor that didn't even get up in front of people and talk much. He just didn't know what to do. He was panicking, like, where's the president? Where's everybody at? And he just got up and was like, everybody leave. It's done. <laughs> you know, but it was like chaos. It was crazy. It was confusion. That's what was happening at the church in Corinth. There was all this confusion happening. And some of the people that were bringing a lot of the confusion were women. There were some of the main people that were doing some of this. Men were doing it, too. Uh, but there's also a lot of other cultural reasons that this also was written, possibly. So a lot of scholars will say in some of the churches in the New Testament, possibly this church as well, the men and the women were separated on different sides. So it says, like, it said in there, like, women should ask questions to their husband at home because potentially there was women that were hearing something, and they were like, well, what does that mean? Let me go ask my husband. And they were walking over like, hey. Hey, oh, hey, what, what, what does that mean, that thing that that guy just said? Like, you know, and everybody's like, what is that, what's that lady doing getting up? You know, it's kind of like when people get up and go to the bathroom in the middle of my sermon. It's kind of like that. But anyways, that's another story. Anyways, I love y'all. But um, so some of that was happening, possibly people yelling across the aisle, you know, like, hey, or people disagreeing with, you know, the prophecies or like some of the stuff I experienced in that one service, right? There was some of that stuff that was going on. So you have to take the context. And even that word where Paul says, be quiet, the Greek word also, it can also mean be still because some people were getting up. They didn't need to disrupt or ask questions. But did this mean that in all churches, women have to be quiet? No. Now why is that? Because in this same exact letter, remember, everybody say context, in this same exact letter, just a few chapters before, in chapter 11, verse 5, in this same letter to the same group of people, Paul here is saying that a woman dishonors her head if she prays at a public worship service or she prophesies without covering her head. So again, context. Because as I look around this room today, um, I don't see too many women that have their head covered. How dare you? And in some of those same passages, it says men should not have their heads covered. But wait a minute, the pastor's wearing a hat. Oh, my goodness, I just need a haircut. It's okay. Uh, but in context, everybody say context. In Middle Eastern culture, it was like it was unheard of for a woman to go in public and not cover her head. And some of these women in the church service were just getting all free and taking it off and waving their hair around. And that was like, that was not modest in their culture. 
in American culture today, women don't cover their heads, and that's not a big deal. You know, men wear hats everywhere. So it was really a, a, in context about respect and about reverence. So if you translate that to, t- to today for women, you don't have to cover your head when you come in church. But how do you reverence God? Through your modesty. When you come into church, you should dress modest because that was modesty back then. If you took, you know, your head covering off in church, that was considered not to be modest. So, you know, when you come to church, be modest. You can be casual, but you don't need to look like you're going to the club. You shouldn't be looking like that anyways, ever. Anyways, that's another story because hashtag modest is hottest. You can post that up on your IG, right? But so, but did you catch it said that women could pray and prophesy in church if they had a head covering. So that means that they could speak. So Paul wouldn't, like, go against himself, right? Because there's context, y'all. You got to look at the context of the conversation of what he was saying and what was happening in each one of these scenarios that he was addressing. Now, there's other passages in the scripture that also, also show women speaking and leading um, there was Priscilla in the book of Acts. She was one of the main leaders of the church that she was at. I mean, there was um, uh, even an apostle, Junia, that's talked about in the New Testament. That was a female. There was many women that led. And even in the Old Testament, there was women that led. So why would there be all these other places where women were able to lead, but now suddenly they weren't allowed to lead? Somebody say context. It's context. Y'all got it? Y'all good? Okay, ladies, be quiet. No, I'm just kidding. All right, so I'm going to have a lady talk right now. Is that okay? It's okay, right? All right, Siri, are you there? Hey, Pastor T, are you ready? You have to answer quickly and not give any websites like I do. LOL. There I go again. Ha, ha, ha. I made another funny. All right, I'm going to be put in the hot seat. I got to answer these questions as quickly as I can, so pray for me. All right, Siri, I'm ready. Go ahead. Where you at? Okay, let's get started. First question. Is it okay to judge Christians? Yes. It is. It is for real. Siri, uh, it does in context. Everybody say context. In 1 Corinthians 5, 2, it says, we're not supposed to judge outsiders, but brothers and sisters in Christ, we are supposed to hold them accountable. It doesn't mean we get in their face and judge them in a bad way, but if they're doing something wrong or they're struggling in some area, we're supposed to lovingly talk to them and show them um, you know, the way that they should go and pray for them. And we're going to talk about that more this Wednesday night at the re-up. Next question. Second question. How do dinosaurs fit into the Bible? They don't. They're really big. I don't see how they would fit in that little book now. Uh, there, there, there's a, a word in the Old Testament in Hebrew. It's tannin And it actually means like a large sea creature or like a serpent or a dragon, like a big reptile. And that's actually mentioned 28 times in the Old Testament. In the book of Job, chapter 40, um, there's this animal that's called a behemoth. In Isaiah, in Psalms, um, there's this other creature that's called the Leviathan. And so um, those are these large animals. There's a lot of people that believe those could possibly be referring to dinosaurs. If you're interested in that, uh, you can go ahead and Google creation science. Yeah. Okay. Third question. Lots of Christians use the term good luck. Is that going against the word of God? All right, good question. I'm not even going to go there because we're actually going there uh, on Wednesday, July 25th. I'm going to be talking about it at the re-up. There's a lot to unpack. We're going to talk about that uh, dumb thing smart Christians say. All right, next question. Fourth question. Why were some books not included in the Bible? Like the book of Enoch, the book of Thomas, and even the book of Siri. LOL. Ha, ha, ha. I just can't help myself. (laughs) All right. The book of Siri. Uh, That's a new one right there. Bottom line is some people refer to those as the lost gospels. The gospels we do have in the Bible, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they were written uh, within the first century, meaning like in the lifetime after Jesus died. So they were written by um, those people when they were still alive. There was eyewitnesses that could have refuted it. It was wrong. I mean, those were the verses in the Gospels that were being repeated and read in churches. So these lost Gospels were written and found hundreds of years later. Um, some of them were found even over a thousand years later. And so there was no authenticity in it that you could really find who really wrote it, no proof. On top of that, a lot of the stuff that are in those Gospels 
um, says some really contradictory, weird stuff. And so that's why they were not included in the Bible that we have today, which is known as the scripture, the canon. Last, Last question. question. What is the difference between going to the casino and the stock market? Aren't they both gambling? Also, is it okay that some Christians approve of stocks but don't approve of going to the casino? Speaking of casinos, I found a link for Ocean's 8. Starting Ocean's 8 playback. Just kidding. Ha ha ha. <laughs> Alright Siri, well, okay so, um, there, is a, there is a difference. I mean, investing in the stock market can sometimes be risky depending on what kind of stocks you uh, invest in. Futures are very risky, but having a 401k or a Roth IRA and having it in a moderate type of investments um, is, is rather safe. Sometimes the stocks go up, they go down, but overall you can look at people uh, and, and they gain money many times throughout the, the, the course of their investment. These are real companies they're investing in that are doing real business and they're trying to actually make money for the stockholders so they can sell more stock. On the other hand, casinos are, are not investments. <laughs> Casinos are just there trying to get your money by you playing a game of chance and the odds are stacked way against you. All right, so give it up for Siri. That's it, that's the hot seat. So here is the final question of today. Are y'all still with me? Okay, so this is the big question. All right, so pray for Pastor T. Build the anticipation for it. So this question was asked by quite a few people, and uh, just going to read one of them. Why is pleasure through masturbation different than pleasure through eating when they both satisfy? Signed. No, I'm just kidding. Again, all these questions were anonymous. They were asking for a friend. Actually, that's what they were doing. So I've heard some people say that think it's sin, and they'll quote a Bible verse like Genesis 3:3. 3, 3. They'll say. You know, if you touch it, you will die. <laughs> Come on, you can laugh a little bit, like lighten up. Um, I just, you know, we got to laugh a little bit. This is difficult to talk about. Help me out, okay? Just got to break the ice a little bit. Seriously, what does the Bible say about this topic? It actually says nothing directly to it. It doesn't say anything directly to it. So we're going to look at some principles from the Bible this is one of those subjects that a lot of people will kind of rationalize and they'll say, well, you know, I'm not hurting anybody when I do this. Or, you know, if I do this, it keeps me from doing something that's way worse. Or if somebody's married, they might say, well, my spouse is not meeting my needs. And so I do this just to try to get by. Or, you know, somebody, you know, can say, well, you know, I'm not really thinking any sinful thoughts uh, really when it's happening. Or, you know, somebody might say, you know, well, everybody does it. You know, but everybody doesn't do it. But anyways, these are things that people will say to rationalize it. So the Bible is actually silent on this issue. And the Bible is pretty explicit about a lot of different sexual things. Bible's silent on this. So some people will say, well, it's okay as long as you don't think any lustful thoughts. On the other extreme, there's a group of people that claim, no, it's absolutely sin. And they'll quote some different verses. Uh, one of them they might quote is uh, Genesis 38. This guy named Onan, he uh, was sleeping with this woman named Tamar, and, you know, he was kind of had to, by obligation, marry her because she was part of the family and give her children, keep the inheritance and the family bloodline going, and he was being selfish and he didn't want to, and he spilled his seed, his sperm, like they were having sex, and, you know, he pulled out. So anyways, yeah, y'all kind of, I don't want to paint the picture too much, but anyway, so... <laughs> So the Lord got angry with him because he was sinning and doing that, and he actually died from it. So some people point to that and say, see, like if you spill your seed, you're going to die. The Lord's going to get you, you know. It's all kinds of like myths. You're going to go blind if you do that. It's all kinds of things, you know. Like, so anyways, but everybody say context. Context is key because that, that wasn't what this passage meant. So that's out of context. You got to be careful. People twist scriptures to mean whatever they want. So, but, but here's a biblical principle that we can look at. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3, it says this. It says, among you, there must not even be a, a what? A hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or greed because these things are improper for God's holy people. So not even a hint of sexual immorality. So even if you 
argue that the act itself of the thing I'm talking about, I don't want to keep saying it, um, is, 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 well, that's not really sinful, but the things that lead up to it, because it all usually starts right here, right? And many times that might even start through you lusting because you saw somebody and it triggered something, or because you were on Instagram and you were scrolling through and then you saw a picture and then, oh, and it just led to something. Or maybe because we have these devices all the time, you went to some websites or some things that you shouldn't have and you're actually looking at pornography. And there's all kinds of lust involved, right? And, you know, so the acts leading up to it, it deals many times with lust, with fantasy, with all kinds of things that accompany masturbation. So it's difficult not to have a hint of sexual immorality. Y'all feel me? Y'all know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, yeah. Uh, so, so now listen, though. I'm careful not to make blanket statements about stuff. When I was younger, maybe I, I did more of that when we are younger, but as we get older, we have more life experience, as we get more mature, as we get deeper in our theology and our study of Scripture, and, and we just, we hear lots of different questions because this question can have a lot of layers to it. I've had people ask me as a pastor all kinds of different questions. Questions like, well, you know, my spouse wasn't in the mood, married people, and they told me I could go do it. Oh, so I have permission? Okay, so it's okay. Or, or, well, what if I do it and I think about my spouse or somebody that's not married? What if I do it and I think about my future spouse? You don't even know who they are. You know, like, oh, I'm just, you know, dreaming of, like, something, you know. Um, or, or, or what about somebody that says, well, wait a minute, my, my spouse is deployed, and we're apart for like a year, you know, or, or, or you know, or is it okay that I, I do that on the phone with, with my spouse? Or is it, you know, there's all these different questions. That, or my spouse is sick, and they're not able to be intimate anymore. So, so what does all that look like? And again, people will say, well, what if I just don't think about anything? And, you know, so there's a lot of layers to a question like this. I don't want to make just one blanket statement, but I do want to say this, guys. I want to rather lean to the side of caution that you abstain from this as much as possible because it could be in many, many situations or definitely it could become sin. It could definitely become an addiction. I mean, a lot of people are caught up in pornography um, because it's so easily accessible on our little screens and people get caught up in that. And here's what that does so many times, y'all. It creates this, this private, this this sin that's in their closet, the secret that they have, and they're embarrassed because it's an embarrassing thing to talk about. But we're talking about it in the church city because it's a real thing. And most people have dealt with it at some point or another in different seasons of their life. Let's be real. It's just reality. Look at the stats. So we got to talk about it because what, what do we do with that as a Christ follower? Because I know there's a lot of people that walk in here every single week or people that don't walk in here because they struggle with this and they're embarrassed. And it holds them back from the calling that God has on their life. Because they have this secret sin in the dark, and they don't want to talk to anybody because it's embarrassing. And, you know, and they want to act like they got it all together. But because they got this, they don't take their next step in their walk with Jesus. Well, I don't want to go to the growth track because, uh, you know, I'm still, I got to stop doing this thing and a couple other things. And, you know, well, maybe they do go to the growth track, but no, I don't really want to serve because I'm not worthy to serve because I still got this issue in my life. And I'm struggling in these areas. And it can be such a battle and a thing. So here's a few verses to consider as we battle for purity in a sex-charged world. Because everywhere we look, sex is hitting us left and right every day, right? Billboards, songs on the radio, TV shows, things we see on Facebook, conversations happening at our job. It's constantly hitting us, right? In the, in the scripture, Job said this. He said, I've made a covenant, made an agreement with my eyes not to look lustfully at a girl. So before the physical act, there's always a thought, isn't there? So Job is saying, man, I'm not even going to look. Like if I see a pretty girl, like I'm, okay, I'm going to bounce my eyes. I'm not going to keep looking and checking her out up and down like so many guys do, and they just fall into that, right? So Paul said this. He, he told the Corinthians this. He said, we take captive. Everybody say captive. We take captive every thought. We submit it and make it obedient to Christ. So if you have a runaway lustful thought in your life in a moment or whatever. You know what you do? You need to submit it to Christ 
and get yourself in a place where maybe you turn some worship music on. Maybe you get down on your knees and pray. Maybe you read the scripture. Maybe you're quoting some scripture. Maybe you call a friend. Like, do something to get out of that moment to try to run away from it. So the scripture says, we talked about this a few weeks ago, God never said he won't give you more than you can handle. In context, everybody say context. That scripture said he won't give you more temptation than you can handle. But sometimes for many of us, when we're in the middle of the temptation, and we might be aroused, and we're thinking about all these lustful things. We're not looking for a way out. But God will always provide a way out. He'll provide a way out for it, but we have to be looking for it. Take that thought captive, right? Second thing is this. Jesus taught in Matthew 5, 28. He said this. He said, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Throw it away. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Throw it away. So next week here at Crossover, there might be a lot of people walking around like, one arm cyclops is, I don't know. <laughs> no. Listen, look at me, guys. Jesus did not mean to literally poke your eye out or to chop anything off, okay? So don't go home and be like, oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, what, no. what Jesus was saying here in context, he was saying, whatever is causing you to sin, remove it from your life. Run away from it. So whatever that might be for you, you might go to the gym and you just start looking at people and you start lusting. Maybe you don't need to go to the gym anymore. Maybe you need to just work out at home and put an app up on the TV or something. Work out by yourself. Or invite your friend to come over or something, you know, as long as you ain't lusting after them. Uh, maybe you need to cut cable because there's stuff on there that, you know, it just triggers stuff. But then you can stream stuff. So maybe you just need to put some blocks and some filters on your Internet or have some accountability to where there's, there's Internet software. You can set it up. So if I set it up in my accountability with, with Rich, you know, and, and with, with, with Johnny, you know, if I look at something, it'll pop up on their website, on, on their email, like, boop. You know, Tommy's looking at something, be, Rich will be like, yo, Pastor T, you all right? You know, <laughs> what, you, what you doing? Like, oh, you know what I mean? And I know that that's going to pop up, so then I'm not going to do it because there's accountability, right? And we can call somebody and talk to them. So whatever that takes, the point is Jesus is saying, like, remove it from your life. Find a way, like, at all costs to Avoid it. Get away from it. So here's the third thing, y'all. Here's the third thing. The last thing. We're going to close with this today, y'all. There's a state of purity that many people believe is not possible. Many people believe, well, it's just not possible. It's not possible because I, I've messed up so much and, you know, I, I've made all these mistakes and, you know, I, I, I was a virgin, but I messed that up and, you know, I slept with different people and, well, I've had this masturbation thing for years and it's just who I am and I think that way. I, I, I just can't fix this. I can't get out of it. Look at me today, y'all. Don't fall for the enemy's lie. Don't fall for the enemy's lie. The Bible says that when you become new in Christ, you become a new creation, the old is gone, and you become a new person. How many of y'all believe that? God can renew your mind, renew your heart, renew your spirit. He can remove stuff out of that hard drive that's in your head, but you got to let him in. you got to admit, like, I got this struggle. I got this thing going on. Like, let me submit this to you, God. I need some help. I need some accountability partners. I, I, I want to have sexual purity. It's possible. And when you do that stuff for a long time in a negative way and you're doing impure things um, and looking at porn even, it can rewire your brain in the way you think. And some of you, every time you look at somebody, you can start undressing them and thinking some things you shouldn't. I'm being real today, y'all. I already said a bunch of stuff, so let me just, you know, right? A lot of you struggle with that. God can take that away from you. He can rewire your brain, even if your computer hard drive up here is damaged and has all this junk in it, he can take a lot of that stuff out and he can heal your mind. He can heal your heart. I know there's many of us in here that he's healed in that area. A lot of us, almost everybody has struggled with lustful thoughts at some point or another. And I know there's some people in here say, we got, we got any people that can testify? You don't have to testify now, but if you can raise your hand and say, God's healed me from that. I, I'm not the person I used to be. My hand is up. There was a season in my life where, man, I struggle with some of that stuff. A lot of guys do. But God healed my mind, renewed my mind. I don't, I don't think that way. I don't, I don't look at porn. I don't struggle with that. I haven't in decades. Why? Because God has renewed my mind. I have this new state of purity, and I want to share with you guys today. It's possible for you. It's possible. Yeah, you got to maybe change some of your habits, 
change some of the things that you do, but it's absolutely possible. Anything's possible with Jesus. How many of y'all believe that today? It's possible. It's possible. We're going to go ahead and pray. I want you to bow your heads around the room, and I want to pray for you guys today. And I know we talked about some serious stuff today, some challenging things. And if you're here today and any of those things spoke to you, maybe you're in a relationship and you're wrestling with the roles right now. Or your spouse is not being the person they should be in their role. Maybe you're single still. Or maybe you are single again and you're still wrestling with the roles of what that may look like someday. Or what it looked like before and it was all messed up and now you're single again. And so maybe a lot of that stuff just touched a, touched a nerve in your heart today. Maybe there's some of you today that are wrestling with your purity. And it's been a challenge. I want to pray for you today. I'm not going to ask you to stand up or come down front or anything. I know this can be something that can be very touchy and very private, right? But I, I, here's what I want you to do. If you're here physically with me and, and you're like, man, just pray for me, Pastor T. Wrestling in some of these areas that we talked about today. Just, just look up at me real quick. That's you. All right. I see you. I see you. God sees you. He sees your heart. There's healing available. There's peace available. There's purity available. Let's pray. Father, we love you today. God, we come before you humbly, and first of all, we say thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the gospel, the good news that we can have forgiveness, we can have new life. And God, there's even some people that are here today, some people worshiping online that they've got some areas of their life, God, they've been wrestling with some some sin, they haven't been doing things the way that you've mapped it out in Scripture. God, so I pray for each person that's wrestling with maybe their role as a woman, their role as a man. God, that they'll submit to you and submit to one another. We talked about what the Scripture says. God, I pray for some people here that are wrestling with their sexuality, their sexual purity whether they're single or they're married or they're engaged or they're dating or whatever, God, it's one of the biggest areas the enemy will trip people up in. I've watched so many people leave this church family because they got messed up in that area and they just fell off. And they were too embarrassed to come back and get help or talk about it or they just wanted to continue in their sin. Lots of different reasons, but I've seen it wreck so many lives and take people off track. I pray, God, for people that are wrestling with that right now, with their sexual purity. We live in a culture that we're bombarded every day with so many sexual messages that are opposite from your plan. We're bombarded with the bootleg version, God, but help us not to fall for it just because it's easier and it's cheaper. Help us not to be cheap. Help us to value ourselves. We're a son of God. We're a daughter of God. We're made in your image. And you got a plan for our lives. You love us. So, God, I just pray for peace today. I pray, God, if there's people that are wrestling in some areas that even before today is over, that they're going to get with someone and talk to them. They're going to become accountable. So they're going to become accountable again. Even before some people leave this building in that lobby, in that parking lot, there's going to be some real conversations in that prayer room. Maybe people are going to go visit somebody today or call somebody and just get accountable and get real get healed, become the person you've called them to be. So God, we thank you for what you're doing, even in the middle of these questions. Thank you for allowing us to have a church where we can be real, and we can talk about real issues, and we can find real answers in your word. Pray this in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. If you could stand with me around the room, give God some praise today. Aren't you glad the Bible talks about some of these questions we have? So we're going to dismiss in just a moment, and I uh, want to encourage you today, if you want to grow as a leader, we have, and you've gone through the 3D growth track, we have the HD class is in classroom three, coming up in a few minutes at 1230. If you're interested in going to Flavor Fest, um, you can check out the table in the middle of the lobby, Southeastern University. If you're looking at going back to school, becoming a leader, um, there's a table in the middle of the lobby as well. Uh, how many of y'all enjoyed my man, Raw Servant? Check it out. Raw Servant has hundreds of free CDs. 
So stop by his table in the middle of the lobby. He'll bless you with a CD. He's got some hats and some shirts. I got a hat. Um, he's got some of that out there if you want to purchase one. And just go out and show him some love. Say what's up to him. And uh, let's go ahead and read our mission statement. So glad you guys are with us today. Send you out with this. This is what we're about here. Let's read it. Count of three. Ready? Our mission is to empower people to discover, develop, display Jesus Christ in every area of their lives. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week.